Clips versus flats is one of those age-old debates, but whichever camp you fit into, you can't deny that clipless pedals is one of the biggest pieces of technology to enter mountain biking. So how did we go from toe straps to being totally clipped in? And how did Shimano end up at the forefront of this technology? We're here at the Marin Museum of Bicycling to get a little history lesson. Shimano are known for being at the forefront of mountain bike technology and that reputation was hard earned in the late 80s when mountain biking was just gathering momentum and their drivetrain and their shifter technology was so groundbreaking and so good that we're largely still using that technology today. Another thing that Shimano are synonymous for is clipless pedal technology. And it's thanks to Shimano actually for supporting this video so I can be here in California today to show you how it all played out. This museum is in Fairfax in California, which is arguably where it all began. It's arguably the birthplace for mountain biking, where a bunch of crazy Californians took their beach cruisers to a hill just down the road, actually. on this very dirt path where a bunch of regular downhill races started to occur and the course was affectionately known as Repack. Now these races started to snowball and gathered huge media attention and they were pioneered by the likes of Charlie Kelly, Gary Fisher, Joe Breeze and many more who would go on to create bespoke bikes and technology for this new sport they were calling mountain biking. It's a gnarly course, and uh, I tell people today, in the summertime, be very careful. It's a bunch of loose marbles out there. We did it mostly in the wintertime, and uh, it's a challenge. By the early 80s, bike frames were being specifically made for this new and exciting sport. And Shimano, hearing of the commotion over the waters in Japan, decided to come right here to the source to figure out what was going on and how they could be a part of it. At this time, Shimano were already flexing their design genius by releasing the Shimano DX flat pedal, which at the time people were using bear traps and rat traps, which were terrible for grip and support and shin safety and these DX flat pedals would offer a light aluminium body with hard wearing steel pins and it had this slanted parallelogram shape that meant if you were to put your foot on the side of the pedal by mistake it would automatically correct itself. Now these pedals were actually BMX specific at that time. They were only available in the half inch thread for BMX cranks. They weren't available in the 9 16 inch thread that mountain bike pedals used and I think they weren't largely taken seriously until the mid-90s when the likes of GT and DMR started releasing pedals that were largely a carbon copy and to be honest is still a shape we're very familiar with today. By the late 80s, mountain bikers started to experiment with road pedals so that they could get better connectivity with the bike and enjoy all of the power transfer that the roadies were getting. The problem with that was that the road pedals were single-sided, so they were slow and difficult to get in and out of, and the shoes that you needed had stiff soles with pronounced cleats, which made hiker bikes and walking really difficult. So Shimano knew that they needed a dual-sided approach to the pedal, and they knew that they needed the cleats to be recessed into trainers. 
By fortuitous coincidence, Yoshi Shimano, the owner of Shimano, had a son who worked for ASICS, which is a sneaker company based in California, who were already jumping on the jogging boom from the late 70s. And they began partnering up by gluing and cutting the soles to house a cleat. And these early prototypes were rumored to be tested by legends such as John Tomac. And rumor has it, you could hear them shouting and swearing in a forest somewhere in Japan as they tried to find that perfect combo. First time I rode those pedals, it was actually near the Shimano factory in uh, Sekai City in Japan. And, and uh, uh, Wayne Stetna and Matt uh, took me out on a ride. They were waiting for me at this trail junction and I come riding up and they all have big smiles on their, they're like these smirks on their faces and what's up here? And I stop and I go to lean over and, and I fall down and it's like, apparently this is what everybody does when they first try these things. And it's a little bit like uh, touching the stove when you're a kid. Do you learn not to do that, right? And okay, ever since I've been kicking out my heel and there's no problem, but it was just this laughable moment for those in the know. <laughs> Then, in 1990, at the World Championships, while everyone else was racing in toe straps and trainers, Julie Furtado and Greg Herbold stood on the podium in the world's first MTB binding shoe and pedal. Shimano would then release the first pedal and shoe to the market adorned with that infamous Shimano pedal dynamic logo. So these are the very first Shimano pedals, and they already look quite familiar already. But if you look closely, you'll see that there's a dual tension system. So they're spring-loaded on both sides. Now this made them really easy to clip into, but it also made them quite easy to accidentally clip out of them. So after a year or so, Shimano decided to bring out two models. They would bring out the Dior LX and the Dior XT. Now the XT was the higher model, and they kept the dual tension system because it allowed riders to put their foot in in any situation. So if you're racing, you could get it in quickly. Uh, however, the Dior LX, the lower spec, had a simpler mechanism that was slightly more affordable and the front was fixed. So you'd put your foot into it and clip down at the back. And actually the pros started to favor the lower spec because it was simpler, it was easy to get into, um, um, and also they found that the pedals started to shed mud a lot better. And so Shimano decided, well, maybe we should just drop the dual tension altogether. So this Dior LX version is pretty much the mechanism we're still using today. So in 1995, Shimano released that shiny high-end XTR pedal, and it pretty much looks like the cross-country pedals we're racing on today. But in 1996, they released something like this, which was another clipless pedal, the Dior LX clipless pedal, which had a clippable flat platform. Now, this was meant for everyday riders to get the best of both worlds in terms of clipless and flats, but it was actually a bit of a free ride favorite and it sparked the movement for cages around the clips so that riders like Missy Giove could shred downhill descents with more support. One thing that hasn't really changed over time is Shimano's cleat mechanism. In fact, the modern cleats are still largely cross-compatible with the old pedals. Now, Shimano came up with this two-bolt sliding system, which allowed riders to adjust them and get the perfect ergonomics on a bike. And in fact, you'll still see this system being used today, even with other brands. And that's because, well, Shimano didn't actually patent the technology, but also because, well, Shimano got it pretty right the first time. And how many pieces of tech do you know could stand the test of 30 years? If you look 
pedals from today and compare them to those from the early 90s, not much has really changed. The cleat mechanism's the same, the internals are largely the same. Okay, there's lighter materials now used and better mud shedding, but it's just finessing. The overall design is largely the same. And that is testament to how good they got it the first time. And I think that's why a lot of people refer to Clippers pedals as SPDs or spuds. Uh, even if they're not referring to Shimano pedals. So there you have the story of SPDs. And I've got to say, I think it's the best invention to hit mountain biking. And I love riding in clipless pedals. But let me know what you think down in the comments below. Are you a fan of clipless pedals? Are you more of a fan now that you've heard the story? Let me know, share your thoughts down below.